Hello, friends. My name is Gabriel. This is Exploring the Quran and the Bible. I am in my office here at the University of Notre Dame. This is an extraordinary conversation with a wonderful, dynamic, learned professor, Sherry Lowen. We speak together about the Hebrew Bible and the Quran. We speak in particular about why the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament seems to have stories that have prophets behaving badly. Do the prophets really behave badly? In the Bible, how are you to understand these stories about figures the Quran describes as prophets in the Bible? We also speak about what the Quran says about Jews and what the Quran says the Jews say about God. It's really great that you've uh, visited us here exploring the Quran and the Bible. Uh, please take a moment to like this video and to subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much. Hello, Professor Sherry Lowen. Thank you for being with me. Hi. <laughs> It's really great to have you here to speak a little bit about the Quran and the Bible. Everyone, I'm going to um, start with a brief introduction of Professor Lowen, and then we're going to speak about uh, some intriguing questions. For example, why does it seem like characters that are dear to the Quran as prophets behave badly in the way that they appear in the Bible? Uh, so we'll speak about uh, that, that question, and then we're going to turn to some of the studies that Professor Lowen has done about um, Bible and Quran on figures uh, such as Noah, who appears quite um, to have different characteristics in the Quran, quite different characteristics, and uh, some of her uh, current work on uh, some of the ways in which Jews in the Quran are quoted as describing uh, God, and also some descriptions about um, the Israelites in the Quran. So, uh, yeah, so let me go ahead and start with a brief uh, uh, biography before we get into these intriguing questions. Everyone, friends, uh, Sherry Lowen is professor in the Religious Studies Department of Stonehill College. Her research centers on the interplay between Islamic and Jewish texts in the early and early medieval Islamic periods, focusing mainly on scriptural and exegetical narratives. She is the author of The Making of a Forefather, Abraham and Islamic and Jewish Exegetical Narratives, as well as Arabic and Hebrew Love Poems of El Andalus, a study of these exegetical narratives in the desire poetry of Spain, her current project re-examines the Quranic verses attributed to the Jews in the light of the Midrash and Piyut, and we'll explain what those two terms mean along the way. So you can't stop listening now because you never know what Midrash and Piyut mean if you do. She is the editor of the Review of Quranic Research, and uh, she's the author of a 2019 article, which will come up in our conversation uh, in the Journal of Quranic Studies, uh, entitled, The Jews Say the Hand of God is Chained, Quran 564 as a response to a Midrash and a Piyut, by Rabbi Eliezer HaKalir, I think. Uh, is that pronunciation somewhat close to? Excellent, yeah. Okay, that's nice of you. All right, so yeah, I wanted to start with a question that I alluded to at the very opening, which is uh, sometimes people who know the Quran and um, particularly those who are sort of familiar with the idea that um, the prophets in the Quran are impeccable, sinless, um, they might then read stories that appear about figures with the same names, say Noah and Lot, maybe David, in the Bible. And uh, in some of these stories, uh, these characters seem to be behaving badly. So, yeah, could you sort of um, speak to this whole issue? Uh, why is it that characters like Noah and Lot, whom Muslims may know as prophets, impeccable prophets, uh, do these peculiar things in the Bible? Sure. First of all, thank you for having me. Um, I appreciate it. Um, so uh, two things, I guess, are important to recognize uh, in addressing that question. One is that obviously it's not Muslims of the 20th, 21st century alone who have noticed these issues, that this, the difference between the behavior of these shared prophets um, in the Bible and in the Quran were noticed in the medieval era, and it was part of the polemics. Um, sort of the Christian Jewish, uh, the Muslim Jewish polemics in the medieval right. period, sort of showing the um, the primacy or the victory of the Quran, sort of the Quran as a better version of the revelation and the Bible is sort of a messed up version of the revelation. But um, what it's important to realize is that the Bible does not intend for the, the people who are behaving badly in the Bible are recognized as behaving badly in the Bible. In other That's words, a really the, good point. Yeah. The, that the Quran has a has an understanding that that all these characters are prophets, and that therefore the expectation is that they should behave in a prophetic fashion, sort of as a person who is worthy of of conversation with God. 
Um, but not all of these people who whom the Quran labels prophets are actually labeled as prophets in the Bible. So they're and, not always uh, examples to be imitated or exemplary. No, sometimes they're in fact examples to be to to do the opposite. Right. Right. So so they do X, and then the story is you don't do that, and that that person becomes um, an example of of proper behavior in the Quran. But he, he didn't start that way. In, not start that way. I shouldn't say it that way. But he he didn't appear that way in the in the biblical um, in the biblical materials, um, and so right. So so the person is not a prophet and is not a model of exemplary behavior. It's just a character, and the definition of what a, of what prophecy means or what a prophet means in the Islamic system and in the biblical system is different. So just because someone talks to God or God talks to them doesn't give them the designation of prophet in the biblical worldview. So you have people that God talks to. Um, for instance, in the rabbinic understanding, the forefathers aren't prophets. They're not called prophets the way that the Quran would call Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Ishmael, that would call them prophets. And even though they all talk to God and God talks to them in the Bible, and in a sense, they have the spirit of prophecy, they're not part of that class of people that we would right. call right. prophets mm -hmm. in the, in the uh, rabbinic system and in the sort of the rabbinic understanding of the biblical worldview. So, um, and there is no sense of, of the isma of the prophets, sort of this infallibility, even the people who are prophets in the Bible don't have infallibility, which is a completely different understanding of what a prophet should behave like. Right, right. Okay, so uh, what is it that makes prophets prophets in the Bible? I mean, the class because you mentioned like you know yeah. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, the, as you mentioned, forefathers or patriarchs. We don't think uh, the Bible doesn't present them principally or at all as prophets. So, what is a prophet in the Bible? It it looks like the pro the people who are who are um, classically presented as prophets. I mean, the Bible doesn't talk about sort of a class of people. I think it's us as readers that give them the designation or the, or the rabbinic readers give them the designation of a class of prophets. Seems to be people who come with a mission. And so in that sense, it is equivalent to um, to sort of to prophets in the Quran, that they are, they're leaders of the community. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob aren't primarily leaders of communities, right? They're the, they're the forefathers sort of start sort of the whole- On their own. <laughs> yeah, they like set it in motion, but there's not really a community that they're leadership of. So in that sense, Moses is is really a prophet. He has a community that he's that he's in charge of and he's leading, and they use their um, relationship with God or their communication with God as as part of their being the leader, right? So like they're they're God chooses them for that job, and that it's it's their relationship with God that gives them that authority and that sense of guidance so most of the people in the hebrew bible section of the book called prophets that's where you would find like the class of prophets but but um and just to, can i step back just to clarify i mean our, our viewers may or may not know that the hebrew bible i think is traditionally uh uh understood by jews as consisting of the torah the prophets and the writings so that's yeah okay. yeah so the 27 books of the hebrew bible are divided into three sections and the um, just to explain very briefly, the, the first part goes, the Bible, unlike the Quran, as you know, well know, is um, written in chronological order, right, where the Quran does, is not in mm -hmm. chronological order. Mm -hmm. um, so it starts with creation of the world, and it, it ends, that first section, the Torah ends more or less with the death of Moses, as the Israelites are on the border with the land of Israel to conquer it. And then the next section, which is called the, uh, the prophets section, starts with the conquering and then goes basically almost to the end of the chronological status of the Bible. Um, but the not everybody in the books of prophets are prophets. So there's like a whole um, a whole segment that's actually called Judges, where right the, the biblical book is called the Book of Judges, not the Book of Prophets, even though the judges are themselves frequently in communication with God. So those judges are also prophets, but the designation that they are given is called judges. So yeah. mm -hmm. the designation of what's a prophet is differs in the Hebrew biblical, in the Hebrew Bible perception and in the rabbinic readers after that. So in the Jewish community after that. So again, Moses is a prophet, um, Isaiah, Ezekiel, um, 
I, you know, in the Quran, Aaron is a prophet and he does talk to God in the Hebrew Bible, but he's not classically considered to be a prophet. That's not his main job. His main job is that he's the high priest. So, so does this mean, uh, I mean, does this mean that basically the difference is that in the Quran, prophets are central, the role is sort of foundational for the relationship between God and humanity, and in the Bible, not so much. It's just one of a bunch of vocations and it's not that big of a deal. Uh, not that big of a deal. I don't think that it would. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, that it would. That would be a, a sort of an accurate. Selling way. short. Selling short. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is it found more foundational to the Quran than it is in the Bible? I mean, the conversation and the relationship with God is very foundational in the Hebrew Bible. I just think that the, I feel like in the Quran you get this job description, of. Mm -hmm prophet that is applied to more people and that doesn't necessarily have with it um an idea about leading up a people right i mean i think even in the quran abraham doesn't lead a people yep right so, right. so but he's still considered a prophet right um yeah so it seems like we're just dealing with different sort of religious systems or yeah um, i mean each with its own coherence but um it's it's good to recognize like this is kind of like one system or world over here. This is another one. Can, right. Going back to that initial bit, I mean, so does it solve? Does that solve the problem that uh, Noah and Lot, for example, um, probably David, but you can correct me in the Bible, they're not prophets, so their 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 role is not to act well. Uh, maybe yeah. with David, it's a little more complicated. But at least Noah and Lot, I mean, the role is not really to act well. Um, their role is to for the Bible to tell stories about them that redound to some sort of lesson, whether or not it's someone acting well or someone acting poorly. Does that make sense? Or So Noah and Lot are, I think, two different cases, actually. Okay. okay. Um, because Noah in the Hebrew Bible is called righteous. Right. And so then you would expect him to behave better. Good point. Yes. Than somebody who's not called righteous. And yes. Lot Lot is never called righteous. He's sort of the assumption is that he's righteous by association because he's Abraham's nephew. Mm -hmm. And the Hebrew Bible has them traveling together at the very beginning that that they are together. And when Abraham follows God's word to move from um, from the Ur of the Chaldees into the land of Canaan, he takes Lot with him. Right. That right. Lot is part of his travel. So so you assume that he's gotten a good education on how to be a righteous mm -hmm. person from Abraham. Along the way. And then, I mean, it's a long it's a long journey. Yeah. So they must have been talking about he, something. Right, exactly. Yeah, they they must he must have spoken to his nephew. Um yes. but yeah, but Noah, you expect him to be righteous. Mm -hmm. Um and uh because he is that's the whole reason his whole raison yes. d'etre, right, is that he's yes. righteous and he's his righteousness saves him from destruction. Mm -hmm. And then you see him do things that some obviously problematic and some less obviously problematic. Okay, so the obvious one is getting getting drunk at the end, I guess, right? And yeah, so you know, it's not getting drunk at the end isn't the problem, right? Because being drunk is not a problem in the Hebrew Bible. It's not okay. You can be drunk, and okay. there's no problem with drinking wine. Okay. The the problem is not so much Lot's as his son who sees him naked. Or Noah's. Uh, you said Lot's, but you meant Noah. I'm sorry. I meant Noah. Yes, I'm sorry. Back to Lot. Is that what you asked about? No, no, we're we're talking about Noah totally. Oh, okay. And so the your problem you're saying is is uh is Ham or Canaan. Right. Maybe I don't know if we want to get into the weeds of this question. Right. It's so complicated. But the problem, okay, so the problem is more Ham uh walking into Noah's and seeing right. him naked or Right. I mean the Bible doesn't portray Noah necessarily sort of very obviously as doing something wrong then. Okay. The okay. the exegesis comes in and says, like this was what he did. He just got saved from from devastation and the first thing that he oh. does is plants a vineyard and get but then when you think about that it's not the first thing it takes years to plant a vineyard right right and right. then turn it into wine so so we sort of have this this criticism of him that it's the first thing he did but when you think about sort of time frame it's probably not so first the first thing he does actually is sacrifice to god right mm -hmm. a, a sacrifice of thanks nonetheless it does seem that rolling around naked in your tent that drunk not maybe the best use of your time as a righteous person. Although... There's a really awkward scene. Have you seen the movie Noah, like 15 years old, maybe? 
uh, <laughs> which is sort of premised on there's an the ecological like oh, yeah. humanity is bad because they're ruining the ecology and Noah has compassion for animals and plants. This kind of like, do you know this movie? I vaguely, yeah. But anyway, the scene at the end of the vineyard, the vineyard nakedness scene is it's just awkward to watch. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a strange, it's a strange thing. I mean, I think Noah's um, less obvious shortcoming is that he gets word that the world is going to be destroyed and he doesn't say anything about it to anybody. Right. So I think that's his, and I say less obvious because the text doesn't say you're doing something wrong, Noah, it calls him righteous and then he's quiet, but the rabbinic readers actually notice it um, and comment on it. And it becomes particularly obvious when you compare the Noah story with the Jonah story, which is a very similar situation. Okay, I want to get into that. It's super okay. interesting. Uh, it's really important. I just want to um, take one sort of brief detour just to explain. When you speak about the, the rabbinic commentators, uh, we there are different bodies of Jewish literature out there which are related to the Bible. Um, and I'll say it very briefly, and then you can correct or improve what I say. So one is sort of uh, direct commentary in scripture known as Midrash, maybe, if that's the right way of putting it. And then others are sort of commentary on legal traditions known, I think, generally as Talmud, but actually the the sort of the kernel or the basis of it is a text in Hebrew known as the Mishnah with a commentary on that known as the Talmud. Um, so is that basically okay, or how would you... Um, I would I would just add a few a few things to that, which is that there is a, a corpus of materials called the Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem Talmud. There's two two uh, Talmuds. The one that's more famous is the Babylonian Talmud, and it is primarily used as a legal text, a legal compendium, which starts as the Mishnah and then the second section, which is also called the Talmud, just to be confusing, um, sort of the Gemara. Um, the Mishnah is the legal section sort of pulled out of the Bible and expansions on the legal sections. And then the, the Gemara is the commentary on that. Woven into the Talmud are these other non-legal sections that are called narrative Midrash or Midrash Agada, um, and also legal Midrash, which is Midrash Halakha. And in the narrative Midrash, you find commentaries on the Hebrew Bible, um, on, the, on the stories of the Hebrew Bible that don't have an, a legal point, that they have instead of a homiletical point or an exegetical point. And then there's other texts that aren't in the Talmudic, in the Talmud, mm -hmm. that are either earlier or coterminous with, um, this is sort of what we call the classical Midrashic exegesis, that are other Midrashic sources. So sometimes the snippets of that will appear in the Talmud, sometimes they give you different pieces. So it's, it's a very vast and sort of complex um, corpus of material. Um, but when we talk about Midrash Agada, this narrative Midrash, it, it is that the stories are often what scholars have called narrative expansions. So, you know, the Bible, like the Quran, um, is sort of terse. Um, it's a little less terse than the Quran when it's telling you a story, um, but it is terse. And it's, it's obvious that there's conversations missing, there's holes, there's, there's gaps. Yeah. Yeah, there's strange things happening in the stories that you feel like, why would the Bible include that, but not include, you know, the classical one is about, Cain's murder of Abel and the text says there in Genesis um, and it came to pass while they were in the field um, and Cain said to Abel his brother and Cain rose upon Abel his brother and killed him and you say to yourself there's a someone took a hole punch what do you mean Cain said what did he say right there's something and why do I care that they were in a field what tell me what he said that's what I want to know and yes. I don't care where they are yes. so um, um, rabbinic midrash will come in and sort of expand the narrative to explain to you what's missing and explain to you why there's extraneous material and the answers are taken from from the language of the bible itself either there or in other places in the bible because the rabbis understand all the books of the bible talk to each other so like keep going yeah that's really important keep going okay. so. so that if a word is used one way in the book of genesis and then it's used the next time you see it is like in the minor prophets micah that that's on purpose that they that they know each other and they're talking and you can see al kitab al kitab right exactly the explanation of the book by the book as people do with the quran when they say tafsir right. al quran bil quran right yeah. so um, yeah well yeah I, I was gonna then circle back to the noah 
Jonah point. Um, but I, I mean, and this is super interesting because uh, friends, I mean, viewers and listeners, you, you may be familiar, may have read someone say, oh, the Quran is being midrashic. And if you're not familiar with biblical or Jewish studies, you that might seem like a, I don't know, mysterious, enigmatic uh, turn of phrase there. But I mean, that's kind of what, you know, when a Quran, Quranic study scholar says that such and such a detail um, in the Quranic text, um, uh, you know, maybe in the case of Noah, uh, potentially the conversation, and we'll speak about this conversation between Noah and his people, which doesn't appear in the Bible, seems to be a kind of midrashic element in the Quran. Um, I don't know. Do you think that's fine to speak about the Quran as midrashic? Um, I don't think that the goal of the Quran was to be a midrash on the Hebrew okay. Bible. Okay. Um, so I don't think that's what the Quran, you know, I don't think that the Quran is using as its primary text, the Bible, and then it's it's intending. But I do think that there is a, it, it does feel sometimes like it has a midrashic way of reading the biblical stories or, pre or representing the okay. biblical stories. And I think it... Um, I've used this phrase before in my writing that it it sometimes serves as a corrective to the biblical story that um, you know something's missing from the biblical story and it's a, and it's and it's troubling. Um, and then, for example, the Noah speaking to his people, or not, right? Or, example, and, and not speaking, yeah, good right, time. yeah, <laughs> right. For example, the fact that no one knows the world is going to be flooded, which is a terrible way to go, and he just oh, I'll just build this big boat over here and not invite anybody onto it. Um, you know, the, and not only that, that Noah keeps his mouth quiet and he's very chatty in the Quran, to use your phrase, but he also, we are told in the Bible that Noah is saved because he's righteous. And then his wife and his three sons and his three daughters-in-law are also saved. Are they righteous? But you just told us he's the only righteous person. So why are these people being saved? Mm -hmm. And then the Quran gives you more detail there to tell you that the people that joined Noah on the, on the, boat were not just his family but they were people who followed god as well right right so it, right. it sort of it, it corrects it i mean i don't i don't think it's intending as a yeah again to use the bible as its primary source um who knows but uh, that's but i do think yeah i think that to say that the quran reads midrashically or feels midrashi i think it does feel feel midrashic sometimes so here's a verse from quran surah 11 surah hud uh, about the, about Noah and his people, his generation. This is Quran 1140. When our edict came and the oven gushed, yeah. and there's maybe another Midrashic element, which perhaps we shouldn't speak about now, the, the description of, uh, or the reference to a tanur in Arabic, the oven, uh, caused trouble or con questions for the Mufassirun as well. Anyway, when our edict came and the oven gushed, we said, carry in it a pair of every kind, along with your family, except those against whom the edict has already been given, and those, that is, carry with you, at least according to traditional understanding of the Arabic here, carry with you, along with your family, so your family and those who have faith, and none believed with him except a few. So any any comments on that in light of what we we're just saying? Um, I mean, I think that that is part of the, uh, what was the last phrase that you could you repeat the last uh, one? Against except those against whom the edict has already been given and, and those uh, so uh, those are the ones who will not be taken but in addition to your family those who have faith will be taken and then there's a the final comment in none believed with him except a few right so the question that we sometimes ask the quran right there is what's the family is the family included as believers or are they not included as believers right mm -hmm. so are are his family among those among who believed with him those few who believed with him or his family not those who believed with him and i think that um that's open for question in the quran right that you, you could read it there's also sorry to jump in there's also there's also a larger question of why does what does belief have to do with this right i mean right. in the bible does belief have any role to play in, in save so in the bible the, the sin of the people for which they get destroyed is not entirely clear um, it seems that it's generalized lawlessness and possibly violence, but it's not it's not clearly idolatry um, in the Bible. Um, there is that passage in the Bible before the story of the of Noah. There's a that very strange passage in the Bible 
about the sons of God and the daughters of men mm -hmm. um, producing um, offspring. Mm -hmm. And there's a question, is that a separate story or is that part of the sin that the people are engaging in so that they're engaging in some sort of sexual impropriety? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to have sons of God? Right? Mm -hmm. How are we supposed to understand that? Um, but the, it's not primarily, I mean, almost all of the problems in the Quran that communities face destruction for is because of unbelief in God. Um, but that is not the case in the Bible, that in the Bible, most of the problems are caused by um, immoral behaviors, um, which are connected to somebody being a non-believer in God, right? That if you followed God's word, you wouldn't be such an immoral purpose person. But the, the primary um, categorization of the sin is not one of, idol of idolatry there. It's one of right. some sort of generalized... Yeah. The word is Hamas in Hebrew, okay. uh, which seems to, the, and the rabbis struggle to define what that word, what okay. that word means. Okay. And it, it seems to be some sort of violence and, and generalized lawlessness and that the mm -hmm. people were displeasing God. Yes, um, it is in, in the movie. It is. So that would prove it. Yes. There you right. go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. But I mean, does that mean the Bible? Because you use the word, you use the word corrective of the yeah. word. Uh, I mean, does that mean the, the Quran is correcting the Bible uh, or just um, clearing up an ambiguity or? That I think is a difference. It's it's part of the fundamental differences in the two religious systems that okay. one prioritizes um, submission to God and one uh, has a different way of functioning, right? That there is... Um, I think the thing that that many Muslim readers of the Quran find surprising about the Bible is the way in which the biblical stories and the thing that that rabbis are fairly prou proud of, if I could use that word, mm -hmm. is the is the extent to which the Bible is engages the human imperfect condition mm -hmm. uh, in a way that that the cur readers of the Quran are like, what is going on? Abraham doesn't do bad things. And and then the rabbinic readers are like, look, he did bad things. And then he, so you, you mentioned David before, right? And and um, there's a medieval reader of the story of David that this that King David in the Bible not only commits adultery, but then in order to save his own face, he sleeps with somebody else's wife. And th then when she becomes pregnant in order to save face, he has her husband sent to the front lines of a war to be killed. Um, and and he knows apparently knows that she's married this whole time. And that's a massive sin. And the the Bible admits it and says, you know, everything that David did was pleasing before the Lord, except for what he did when it came to this woman Bathsheba. Mm -hmm. And the Bible doesn't have a problem admitting that. Whereas readers of the Quran would be what is going on right now, right? Why is King David? And and then you get actually generations of rabbinic scholars trying to whitewash David's sin um, and to sort of try to make it less bad than it seems. And then in the medieval period, there's a rabbinic scholar who comes in and says, all of you need to be quiet. It is better to say David sinned very much and repented very much and was forgiven very much. That's the lesson mm -hmm. that you need to glean from that. Right. Right. Um, yes, which is a different lesson from what's happening. David is never accused of not believing in God. He is accused always of being God's confidant to a certain extent or God's beloved mm -hmm. and nonetheless committing an immoral sin. Right. Um, because I think it's such an important point for people not familiar with with the Bible to appreciate yeah, the, the fullness of the human experience the possibility of uh, serious sin by characters who are protagonists, and the lesson being in the uh, the the danger of anyone sinning, the or the importance right. of repentance. Because I, I mean, the Bible in the David story really does emphasize his repentance as well, right? And, yes. Yeah. And it's a hard repentance. Yeah. Right. But, yeah. but there's some yeah. of this. There's some of this. Well, first of all, I, I, it's worth pointing out that in the Quran, it becomes. Or, or interpretation of Quran becomes a problem because there are references to David as penitent. Uh, a web might be the word, but someone in the comments may correct me there. Um, and um, uh, also, uh, there's a reference to him bowing down, apparently in in repentance, uh, prostrating himself. 
I think that's one of the places where the Quranic text indicates that the faithful reader of the text is to himself do a sajda or herself, a prostration. And then and then commentators are in different places about like some of the qisas al anbiya will tell the Bathsheba story and others will not. So yeah. Um, but it, going all the way back, because we were going to speak about Noah in contrast to Jonah. Is yeah. that okay? Can we speak about sure, that? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, you, you mentioned that Noah, there's this problem because he's said to be righteous um, or maybe alone righteous in his generation. Does it specify yeah. that? Noah was right. It just says Noah just was righteous, righteous in his generation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And um, but then he doesn't warn the people. So how could yeah. he be righteous? If he doesn't? But then in uh, in the case of of Jonah, I mean, you said they're contrast, but I don't know if it's worth speaking about this just in the biblical context. But I mean, it's not like Jonah is really eager to go off and warn. No, Nineveh. it's not. Yeah, he so does it in the end, but he does it right. And I think that that's also not just a difference between the pro the prophets Noah and Jonah, but also the way God is presented in these two texts much differently. Um, and in a sense, the Jonah story also brings up an unfavorable presentation of God in the in the Noah story. I, th I think if we're looking maybe just as Noah, you know, there's Noah and Abraham also, that Abraham hears the story in the Hebrew Bible that God is going to overthrow Sodom and Gomorrah, and and he's not, he doesn't even live there, and he tries to talk God out of it and say, like, how could you overthrow these? There's no righteous people on whose behalf you will save the entire earth. And there is this Noah, and Noah's righteousness is not enough to save the entire earth. So, so Noah, who lives in these with these people, doesn't try to argue with God, and Abraham does. But there's also um, this this the the Ninevites. The the way that the Bible talks about the story of Jonah and the Ninevites has a lot of sort of linguistic parallels, also with the story of Noah and the flood. So you have these people who are sinning before God. And God sends a prophet to go tell them that they have a time to repent. I'm going to give them a certain period of time. Three days they... more, right? Three days more. and No, not three. Jonah. Even more than that. Yeah, it's it's some oh. sort of, yeah, I, I think it's more than three days. Okay. Yeah, maybe maybe I'm totally wrong. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Like it's three days to cross Nineveh, the city of Nineveh. Right. I, it may be 40 or something. That yeah, is, it may be yeah I got like that 40. totally wrong. Yeah. So he's the, he got God sends them a prophet to tell them what they're doing is wrong to bring them back into correct practice gives them all this time in which to do it and when the prophet refuses God doesn't say like all right well then I tried you know he tries to get the prophet to go the prophet himself then does a bunch of bad things in other words what do you mean you, the prophet refuses you would never see that in the Quran a prophet refusing. Well, he goes away. I mean, depending on how you read the Quran, it does say right. he goes away. I think Mughedaban is the Arabic word. So and he goes away right. angry. Yeah. So almost like the David, the remnant of the prophet uh, repenting in the case of David, right. there seems to be a remnant of his bad behavior in the Bible when the Quran says he went away angry. Yeah. Although, sorry, I, I don't mean to derail this, okay. but the commentators are uncomfortable with that idea. And they often right. say, no, he went away from the city of Nineveh, not away from God, because right. they had called him a lot. They had made him seem like a liar or something. Right. Which is, by the way, what he says in the Bible. That when he when he gets oh, yes. when he gets to Nineveh and the Ninevites repent, he says to God, see, I told you this would happen. And now now I look like a liar, basically. Yeah. And that passage is. Uh, funny in a way but also beautiful because he says doesn't he say i knew you were a god who is slow to anger quick to quick to forgive and stuff like that so right yeah i knew this was going to happen that 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 yeah so you know the, there is all of this really the story of right so so jonah also he so tries to get away away like he goes in the opposite god tries to send him in one direction and he goes in the opposite direction and then god is sending him in this way and he gets on a boat going that way and you know even when they have to throw him in the bible they there's a big storm and the the pagan sailors figure out that it's the god of the hebrews who's angry at them basically and and that 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 jonah is doing something wrong and rather than asking for repentance he says well just throw me overboard right so they throw him overboard and it's not really until he's in the belly of the fish that he starts to do this repentance Jonah and then finally does right and this idea that 
even if pieces of that story are preserved in the Quran, it's it's like in your face in the Bible. Right. That yeah. That this is sort of bad behavior on a prophet's part. Um, and then you look at the Noah story, and God wants to destroy people. He doesn't send anyone. He doesn't give them any time for penance. They have no idea what they're doing. Maybe, right? Do they know that they that they've been sinning, or do they not know that they've been sinning? And Noah like minds his own business and just does his thing. So you have these this biblical story of Noah that's I don't know if he's behaving badly, but he certainly isn't behaving well. Um, Noah there, and I think the difference with the Noah and the Jonah story really sort of pulls out the difference in God, with the presentation of God. And so what what ends up happening. In the rabbinic tradition, which we see reflected also in the Quran, is this turning Noah more chatty, right? That that mm -hmm. the God in the Quranic story sends Noah, which he doesn't mm -hmm. in the Bible, mm -hmm. which makes God look better in the Quran. Mm -hmm. He tells Noah to tell them to repent, which he doesn't in the Bible, but he does in the rabbinic tradition. Um, and and he ultimately floods the earth when they don't repent. That they're given plenty of time. Super interesting, yeah, terrific. Uh, okay, so on on something you said, and you've sort of returned to right now, or something you said earlier, which is that the Noah story in the Bible seems to present God uh, poorly, or something yeah. like that. I don't want to misquote yeah. you because it's a big theological point. Yes. Um, I mean, uh, I guess you've just answered it. I mean, because I was going to ask whether are are the Jewish readers of this story uncomfortable with that? Do they say it's impossible that God would act this way, and therefore we must add stories to make God seem better? Um, uh, maybe I'll just leave it at that. Do you, any thoughts on that? So there are rabbinic traditions that try to try to fix it, and yeah, and they um, they talk about the fact that it took Noah quite some time to build the ark. And that that was the penance period, right? Okay. That they, so the the narrative expansion sort of takes that piece of information, and then says like, well, clearly it took him I don't know what it was forty days to build the ark. Or I, I don't remember exactly what the Bible says right. for how, for how many days it built the ark, and he's building a huge ark in like his backyard. You think people didn't come and ask him, and then they would come and ask him what he was doing, and he was like, well, God's going to destroy the earth, and then they made fun of him. No, you're a crazy old man. Um, which is very similar. This to what is what the happen. midrash, the Jewish yeah. midrash, says about it. Okay. Yeah, which is similar to what we see in the Quran, also, mm -hmm. right? That they start mm -hmm. making fun of him. As, and as he was building the ark, Quran eleven thirty eight. Whenever the elders of the people passed by him, they would ridicule him. Exactly, and so that that part of his, um, what we don't see in the Bible, which is his being directly sent to um, call them to penance. Is is actually there in the background? Say the rabbinic readers, right? Because it, because it took him all this time, they would have um, been asking him, and he would have told them. And how and how do we know that he would have told them? Because he was righteous. So it stands to reason that if he's righteous, that he would have, he wouldn't have kept silent. Yes, yes. And then we <laughs> find there's a note. Maybe you know this one in First Peter or Second Peter in the New Testament, which speaks of uh points to a number of from a christian perspective old testament figures uh as examples of righteousness and when it gets to Noah, it says the preacher of righteousness right which he's not right in, <laughs> which is not in I mean, genesis yeah right point blank he's not in genesis but they're they're clearly developed this this tradition i don't know i don't know how to say it like underneath the biblical text mm -hmm. that he that he wasn't quiet mm -hmm. because the because what it looks like on its face is not digestible, right? It's it's it it doesn't work for the worldview, and so something else must have happened. And again, the Bible is very very terse, and so clearly there's something else going on there. There's also I, I should say at the same time, just to make things like muddy the waters a little bit, that while there is this rabbinic tradition that states that Noah clearly preached righteousness when people while he was building. Um, there's another tradition that says you should read the phrase Noah was righteous in his generation as saying in comparison to the generation in which he lived, he was righteous. But that's because he lived in a terrible generation. Mm -hmm. And had he lived in another generation, he wouldn't have ranked as so righteous. Yes, yes. So just, there's I, a... Yeah, sorry, so, sorry. 
Oh, I was just gonna say there's a rabbinic tradition that actually logs it that Noah is not mm -hmm. as righteous as the Bible presents him on its in its speech. Yeah. And then there's another rabbinic tradition that tries to make him more righteous than he seems. Yes, yes. Uh, this is just terrific. And um, I, I, my sense is that both for Christian and uh, Muslim viewers, uh, it's just really important to appreciate the capaciousness, I think maybe a word, of the rabbinic midrashic uh, a reading of, of the Bible. So by capacious, I mean just what you represented there, that two opposite views, uh, in, you know, put in, presumably put in conversation. One can imagine yeah. maybe two rabbis representing each view. And it's sort of like, it's okay. Like, it's cool. We can speak about yeah. this. Um, so I did want to mention, though, just about the Quranic Noah business. I was in, I added Christian there, too, because we've mentioned, you know, the Quran and Islamic ideas as having this very sort of pure uh, vision of the prophets as impeccable, etc. But also, I mean, at least in the modern, well, at least in the 21st century American, like children's Bible version yeah. uh, that Christians have a uh, vision, they have Old Testament characters is they're all like heroic figures Perfect. of, yeah, faith and all of this. So um, anyway, but I, I did want to mention that in, in the Quran, I mean, at least my reading of it, it, it's not really that clear that Noah is offering a real proposition, like a, a real warning. Uh, maybe that's not right to put it. But uh, I mean, so the idea you could have is in the Bible, he doesn't do anything. So that's bad. And in the Quran, he's like, please, please begging them to to repent and convert so that they'll be saved. But I mean, the language is actually more complicated in terms of free will, because I mean, just in sort of Tuhud, sort of 11, it opens in the following way, the Noah bit. This is 1136. It was revealed to Noah, none of your people will believe, except those who already have faith. So do not sorrow for what they used to do. And then, I mean, this theme that the condemnation has already been decreed for certain yeah. people, it, it comes up a couple other times, like at verse 39, soon you will know whom a disgraceful punishment will overtake and on whom a lasting punishment will descend. Yeah. So there, there is this compli complication in Quranic theology of this notion that God uh, seems to have sealed certain people's hearts, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. You mentioned that. Yeah, I, that complication is obviously not, um, as you all know, restricted to Noah, to the Noah story. That That's all, that's a complication in chronic theology throughout the Quran, right? That the Quran is constantly calling people back to God and then saying, God guides whom he will. Yes, which, yes. What does that mean? Like, right, right, right. How and am I responsible for anything? Yeah. Right? Just because of theological debate between different movements. Yeah. Well, it, uh, speaking of God uh, and God's freedom, so divine freedom to do whatever he wants, um, I, I want to just go right to the question of that is at the heart of your 2019 Journal of Chronic Studies article. I think I said in the intro, we we're going to speak about Lot and we mentioned him passing really quickly, <laughs> but we're yeah. going to go right on to this uh, article, if that's OK. And the, just a general yeah. topic. So this is uh, an article which is centered around Quran chapter five or 64. So sort of the and And um, this is a passage which includes a polemic against the people of the book, but especially the Israelites, Jews. Uh, that begins earlier, maybe around verse 59 or so, maybe even earlier. Um, but there's different references there. But it, it ends, well, at least sort of the climax of it is verse 64, where we read, uh, the Jews say God's hand is tied up. In the Arabic word there is maglula. Um, tied up be their hands. And then the same, the, 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 the adjectival, the same root is used there for the verb. Rulat, tied up be their hands, and cursed be they for what they say. Rather, his hands are wide open. He bestows as he wishes. So um, again, just maybe to introduce a bit the idea, you mentioned in the article that um, at first glance, this would seem strange to attribute to the Jews the statement, God's hand is tied up, because uh, the, um, the Bible doesn't have the Jews saying this about God, basically. Uh, so I know there's maybe maybe it's unfair because you say so much in the article and you go into different yeah. 
Lot of and maybe you can define for us piyut because there's a piyut that might solve this. Uh, yeah, but how how can the Bible and Jewish tradition help us understand why the Quran has the Jews say God's hand is tied up? So um, what I find interesting about this passage is that um, people have in the past tried to point to a biblical source mm -hmm. where um, where it's not really a good parallel because the I think it's the translation you gave is tied up, but the sort of a more colorful translation would be chained, right? That Mahlula is really, is tied up. It's not just, it's it's your hands are chained. Mm. Um, and the Quran obviously is taking this as a Jewish um, um, statement about God's beneficence, right? Because, it, because the passage says, um, the Jews say the hand of God is chained. May their hands be chained and may they be cursed for what they say. No, his hands are outstretched. Mm -hmm. He gives Mabsutu as he gives. Yeah, Mabsut right. is the Arabic. And then, yeah. and then this yunfik, right? That he's that he's he's giving. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, clearly, when the Jews are in the Quran's understanding, when the Jews are saying that God's hands are chained, it sounds like they're saying he doesn't give to people. And 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 so there are people who've tried to sort of find a parallel in the Hebrew Bible. But there is really no image of God, of a God in chains in the Hebrew Bible. There's a God who throws, who sort of like, it rest, he restrains himself, I guess one, one would say, but not um, not in chains. And um, why would the Quran say that the Jews say this, therefore? Right, yeah. so. In, in the restraining, is it principally in the context of God's, uh, maybe it's the wrong way to put it, but. Uh, in the context of the destruction of the Jerusalem temple and um, God not not intervening because uh, it's his punishment for sin. Not in the Bible. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. It's the, the second, it's the second temple, not the first. Yeah. Okay. So, so in the Bible, it, it's a lot about God restricting his power. Okay. So that God will okay. sort of like, it, it's about power. And in the Quran, it's clearly not about power. In the Quran, it's clearly about God's bounty and his beneficence yes and it's not used that way in the hebrew bible when god yes. restricts himself and and it's usually god's right hand right so there's only one hand that god <laughs> restricts and it's his right hand of power usually um and in the quran it sounds like that that his hands are chained and that someone else chained him right god's hands are chained sounds like someone else came in and chained god's hands whereas in the bible it's usually that god you know, is sort of, of withdrawing. Or, yeah. Yes. And if he's withdrawing his hand, not that it's chained, that, you know, like I, I hand you something and then I go like this, like, you know, so that sort of um, situation. And what we find is that, um, or what I found is, a, should I say what a piyut is? Yes, please. Okay. So there's a category of religious um, liturgical poetry in Judaism that has, in rabbinic Judaism that has not really been used in Quranic studies as a so as an as a, um, a possible source or inspiration for what the Quran says. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that the Quran was reading the Piyut, Um and I don't know if it's possible to know if the Jews of Arabia, um, if the Piyut team had gotten to to the Jews of Arabia at that time because they these Piyut team are largely from the land of Israel. So had they gotten down to Arabia at that time yet? I don't know if, if we can know, um, since the Jewish sources don't really report about these Jews at all, The what we would call Muhammad's Jews, the, the Jewish sources don't report about them. But piyutim are liturgical poems. So by liturgical poetry, I mean poetry that's used in, in, in prayer um, that are written um, to accompany the regular sets of prayers and that are written um, usually on for Sabbaths and for and holidays. Um, and this one, they're almost they don't have names, the poems. They're usually named by the first line of the of the poem that they have. And there are a number of famous, very famous poets. Some of the poems are still in frag in fragments, but we happen to have a poem that is written by um, Elazar Hakalir, who um, his date is a little bit well, not entirely clear. But um, he's said to be around the time of the Quran, so and in the land of Israel, and he writes a poem that is intended to be recited and is actually still recited even today in 2023 on the ninth of the month of the Jewish month of Av, 
mm. which is the holiday that commemorates the destruction of both temples. So the first and the second temples are said to have been, in the rabbinic tradition, said to have been destroyed on the same day, which is the ninth of Av, mm -hmm. um, one in the year 570 and the other in the before the common era and the other in 70 of the common era. Mm -hmm. So um, the story in the Bible talks about the destruction of the first temple. Um, and the second temple's destruction is not in the Hebrew Bible, right? That's in, no. uh, only, only appears in historical texts or rabbinic texts. Yeah. Um, so Hakalir writes a poem called Zuchor et Asher Asat Sar Bifnim, which translates to remember what the enemy did inside, meaning inside the house, mm. which is the house of God, the temple. The temple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's a Midrashic text that tells us that when the Babylonians invaded, um, sorry, not the Babylonians, the Romans. That, that when the Romans invaded in 70, um, Titus um, basically ran amok uh, in this rabbinic tradition. And there's a Midrashic tradition that says that Titus like stormed the temple, went into the Holy of Holies, and uh, depending on which, the, sort of the worst version of it that he, that he basically stabbed the curtain that separated the Holy from the Holy of Holies, meaning nobody goes back there. Um, he stabbed it and he cut it and then he took a pr prostitute or two depending on which version of the story you're reading and he had sex with them on top of the altar in the in the holy sort of the altar that in which sacrifices are performed to god he did this and then he stole all of the gold implements and then and took them back to rome and you, you see this actually in the arch of titus right the arch of titus has that imagery on it in rome so this Piyut, this liturgical poem, takes this midrashic story about what Titus did and hooks it up with the with Lamentations, the Book of Lamentations, which is the biblical book that commemorates the destruction of the first temple. So it it's a poem that uses the first word of every stanza, comes from the Book of Lamentations in sort of an acrostic chapter of Lamentations, but then it talks about the second temple's destruction. So in the rabbinic mind, very frequently the first the destructions of the first and second temples get fused together because mm -hmm. the trauma is the is similar and the trauma is is so great, right? The destruction of the temple. Mm -hmm. And in this piyut, there is a line, would you like me to read it for you? Sure. Yeah. So there's a line in the piyut that basically basically so one of the things that that Jews and, and rabbis struggled with was if the Jews have this covenant with God and a special relationship with God, how did God allow this to happen? Mm -hmm. Not just the first temple destroyed, but then the second temple being destroyed and mm -hmm. still destroyed, right? It's still not mm -hmm. rebuilt. Um, and, and how did God allow not only the temple be destroyed, but the terrible national trauma that ensued, the loss of political and religious autonomy in the homeland, the... Um, sort of hundreds and thousands of years of oppression and suffering that Jews suffered from in the aftermath. And um, uh, the destruction of the land of Israel, sort of the Romans like raised it over, raised the temple over with salt so that nothing could ever grow there again, right? All of this, if the Jews have this relationship with God, what does this mean? And so the Christian, um, starting with Justin Martyr, the Christian understanding was, well, God has rejected the covenant. And in fact, there's a new covenant with us as Christians, and we have sort of replaced mm -hmm. replaced this covenant. And, and you know, you, you had it coming, basically, from all of your sin. Obviously, the rabbis are not willing to give in to that. that there's understanding. possibly something connected to that i sorry i hope this doesn't uh, uh interrupt too much but in quran 61 14 there's a passage where it says jesus speak calls the apostles and he uh says who's who's my helpers and then it says that there were two ta'ifas there were two groups of bani israel and god uh, gave um the ta'ifa that followed jesus and made them made them victorious anyway that could reflect a sort of triumphant uh uh, supersessionist Christian vision of the relationship with Israel. Right? Anyway, yeah. yeah. So there, there is that idea. So, um, so on the Day of Atonement, not only are sorry, Day of Atonement on the ninth of Av, not only are Jews sort of in mourning. It's a, it's a, a fast day, and it's a day of mourning, and all sorts of mourning practices are enacted. You know, clothing that you have to wear that's mourning clothing, not sitting on comfortable chairs. You're spending basically your whole day in prayer. 
not only are Jews sort of mourning the destruction of the two temples, but also a lot of the liturgy has to deal with like, what does this mean for our relationship with God? Mm -hmm. And where does this stand? So the, the poem um, says as follows, um, our souls sank when Titus removed the temple vessels and put them on ships to use them to serve himself. Our flesh melted when the servant awoke to do the service and did not find the 93 temple vessels. The servant there is the, the high priest. So mm -hmm. when the high priest got up in the morning to do the, uh, the sacrifices, there was nothing there to do it with. Uh, and so it's as our flesh melted, meaning probably our hearts melted when he when there was nothing there. Women stared terror stri stricken with the arrival of the tyrant. That's Titus. The nails of his shoes making holes in the ground of the house. That's the temple. The nobles flailed with the coming of the violator who sprayed the house of holiness with his stinking fluid. The young men stood outside strong and watched for him to be chased out by the 60,000 destructive angels. The elders were horrified when he was permitted from above to do his will. So basically the Midrash says that, you know, that when the young soldiers age men saw that this destruction was coming, they ran to the temple to, to defend it. But then they stood back when they saw that God had sent what they thought was 60,000, what are called Mazikin. Have you ever seen the television show Lucifer? Uh, mm -hmm. His, oh, his demon angel is called Mazikin, okay. um, which is sort of a rabbinic title for these, these destructive angels. Um, these 60,000 angels to defend the temple and then they didn't. So the young men who were ready to defend the temple stepped back because they thought that, that God had sent these angels and the angels just stood there and let the temple be destroyed. So it says the elders were horrified when he, that's Titus, was permitted from above by God to do his will. And then the question is whose will is it? Is it his own will or is it God's will? And he was bound in chains and that he was bound in chains is God. So we see in this piyut suddenly this image of a God being bound in chains. And um, one of the interesting things about Piyutim is that Piyutim have a lot of Midrashic information in them. And rabbis initially, the, rabbi, the rabbinic class initially tried to prevent Piyutim from being used because they were full of all sorts of Midrashim that people liked, but the rabbis thought was not authoritative. And they didn't want the PU team transmitting this information. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we end up getting actually fantastic pieces of Jewish mm -hmm. learning in the PU team that's not, mm -hmm. yeah, that's not preserved elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But what we do end up finding when you start to look at um, Midrashic texts or Talmudic texts, that there is an indication that um, Basically, the rabbis have taught that not only did the Israelites go into exile with the destruction of the temple, but God himself is said to have gone into exile. Mm -hmm. And not only were the Israelites bound in chains, but God himself was bound in chains. And the question then becomes why? Why did the rabbis teach that God is bound in chains? And it has to do with the symbiotic relationship. So um, I guess the best way I could sort of sum it up would be to say that there's this Christian idea that of the supersessionism, right? That the Jews, the, the covenant between God and the Jews has been canceled. And that idea also sort of appears in the Quran every now and then, right? That there was this covenant with God, but that it's sort of over and we have a better relationship with God. And the rabbinic texts are coming in and saying, no, it's we have not been replaced. God has not broken his covenant with us. He is with us every step of the way. We are in mourning, he is in mourning. We are enchained, he, he's, he's empathizing, not sympathizing. And whatever happens to us happens to him. And when he decides that we have been suffering enough, he will unchain his own hands. And when he unchains his hands, that will free us as well. So it's this, mm -hmm. it's this, this moment. At the same time, the question is, of course, why does God let the temple be destroyed? And that's also an element of God's love of Israel, which is that the, the understanding is that the Jews had sinned so badly that they actually deserved to be punished worse than they were. And because God loved them so much, he destroyed their temple instead. Mm. So that's why he stands back, right? And he and he chains his hands. He stands back and chains his hands so out of he, love. He, right? He Not his own house to be destroyed and thereby in a way saved his people. Um, exactly right. So when the so what I think is happening in the Quran is that the Quran is saying all of that is nonsense, right? This idea, you know, you, you're talking about the dis nonsense may be strong. You're, you're talking about this idea that God has this continuing and abiding love for you. 
um, but you you're saying crazy things that God's hands are chained and God is God is omnipotent and omniscient and and th that's a crazy thing to say. God, and, God and is it's, not. It's connected here also in the Quran, as as you point out in the article, with another passage which right. I don't think we have time to get into. But Quran three eighty one, which speaks about one eighty one. Uh, 3181 sorry uh with uh where it attributes to the jews the statement that uh, we are rich and, the, and god is poor yeah um so yeah i mean it's for me one really important takeaway is uh i mean, I mean this piyut that you've spoken to us about is post-biblical and as you said quite clearly god's hand is not tied up in the bible um, and so uh, just it's a good reminder to all of us who are interested in understanding the Quran and its relationship to Jewish and Christian tradition, culture, scripture, uh, that um, we're dealing with like the lived ongoing uh, conversations around the Bible among Jews and Christians and not a strict sort of one to one correspondence between Quran and Bible. I think what sometimes happens, I would add to that, is that sometimes when people are looking for sources for what the Quran is talking about, the Jews, mm -hmm. they go further back into ancient texts. So, like, they'll go, oh, it's not in the Bible, maybe it's in, um, or it's not in the materials that's contemporary that we can figure out. So, maybe it's in like the ancient Near Eastern sources, you know, like Metatron and Three Enoch and the Apocalypse, you know, like they, they sort of, I mean, those are, I guess, not further back. Those are um, biblical-esque type of materials, mm -hmm. I guess I would say. Yeah. And I think sometimes we have to move away from that literature and look really what else is going on. As you say, like this lived, how are people talking about it? Yeah. As, and not, and not always, you know, sort of the writing. Yeah, some other, some other, Bible like rewritten Bible sort of right. thing. Yeah. That's great. Uh I, I wish we had more time. I really hope we can have a part two. This was simply yeah. terrific. Yeah. Yeah. We've got to speak about lots. So hopefully we can um have a have a part two to this. Uh but before uh we say goodbye, um if people want to stay in touch with your work, uh what's the best way? Well, hopefully, um, uh, this will be part of a book um, that I'm working on about all of these, the Jews said phrases, or at least phrases that are attributed to the Jews, if not okay. what they said. So hopefully that'll be coming out after my next sabbatical. Um, <laughs> and meanwhile, um, can they find some of your writings on academia or another website? Yeah. Yeah. Academia.edu is usually the place to, to find it, if that site is still allowed to be functioning. <laughs> but with all the closing of those sites yeah yes yes yeah wonderful yeah professor sherry Lowen, thank you so much for being on thank you for having me thank you well, friends, thanks for being with us for this episode of Exploring the Quran and the Bible. I hope you found it to be an edifying discussion. I really hope that you find generally the, um, the content on this channel to be useful. There's a really diverse range of things um, reg in regard to Quranic studies and biblical studies with top-notch scholars. And um, we'll be really grateful for your support. So please don't hesitate to like the videos starting with this one maybe, to subscribe to the channel and to share the news with your friends about exploring the Quran and the Bible.